in about two minutes. And if you're tuning in later and you're not watching this live, then you can fast forward to where we get started. The reminder is only going to be about 10 minutes. You might see later on that the length of this is 30 minutes or something. But that's because at the end, I like to do Q&A, but the reminder is only going to be 10 minutes, inshallah. Ta'ala. So welcome. I'm thankful that you came. It's nice to have you. And we've got people in Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, and all these other nice locations found at your and other fine <laughs> social media apps. So if you want to just tune in, say salam where you're from, and we'll get started in one minute and a half. Tina, wa alaikum as-salam, Asma, wa alaikum as -salam. Trisha says, it's my first time tuning in from Periscope. <laughs> I don't even, yeah, okay. I won't comment about Twitter, but mashallah, tabarakallah. Welcome, Trisha, from Periscope. And if you tune in from like YouTube or Periscope, I try to give you guys more priority because we've never done lives there. And so this is a chance for me to um, give you some, give, you, give some love to Twitter and, and Periscope. And sorry, YouTube. So Salma tuning in from New Jersey. Wa alaikum assalam. Milgo in Toronto. Wa alaikum assalam. Amal. Wa alaikum assalam. Nida from somewhere Toronto. Wa alaikum assalam. Zainab from Brooklyn. And and for those who are inside the Visionaire group, <clears throat> because it's um, a private group, I actually can't see your names. It just says Facebook user. I can't see your names. So my bad. <laughs> Farzana from Perth. Wa alaikum assalam. Abdullahi. In Minneapolis, wa alaikum assalam, welcome. Um, Riti in Michigan, wa alaikum assalam. Faziha, wa alaikum assalam. Lubna, wa alaikum assalam. Sarah says, All I know is Facebook. There's another world out there <laughs> other than Facebook. No worries. Me too. Millie, wa alaikum assalam. Faizan, Dallas, wa alaikum assalam. Nawal, wa alaikum assalam. Susu, with her life and times in Manchester, wa alaikum assalam. Samha in Sri Lanka, wa alaikum assalam. Sri Lankans. Shazar in Trinidad and Tobago, wa alaikum assalam. Samia, wa alaikum assalam. We'll get started. Let's get started. All right, take one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ma wala amma ba'd. So as Ramadan has come to an end, I still wanted to continue this. I really benefited from going into verses and reflecting upon them. It's all my own personal reflection. And I'd love to share with you some of those reflections. I kind of like to stop on verses that make me curious, make me want to think a little bit more about that. I spend some time with it and then I present to you guys here. So the verse that I'm thinking about is this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, where it's verse, um, sorry, Surah number two, verse 26. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min shaytan ar-rajim. Inna Allah la yastahi an yadrib mathalan ma ba'udhatan fama fawqaha. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَيَقُولُونَ فَيَقُولُونَ مَاذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي Allah is not ashamed or Allah does not shy away from. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي and So what is, that, what is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not ashamed to do? أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا that Allah is not ashamed to coin any analogy or draw any comparison that He wishes. Subhanahu wa taala, ma ba'udatan ma fama fawqaha. Allah subhanahu wa taala says that um, verily Allah is not ashamed to make any comparison with anything, 
whether that be a gnat, like a mosquito, or anything larger. And larger could be something even smaller than a mosquito, or it could be larger, something bigger. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wants to make an analogy, He will make it. La yastahi. And this comes from um, mushrikeen polytheists in Mecca. When they heard verses, speaking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speaking about uh, making analogies with mosquitoes, they said something to the effect of, um, isn't God ashamed to make analogies of things like mosquitoes? So they were criticizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the verses of the Quran. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues. Amanu. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes these analogies, makes these comparisons. Amanu annahu al min As for the believers, they know that this is the truth from their Lord. But as for the disbelievers, they say, what does God intend or what's the purpose of or what's Allah's intentions by making analogies um, like this? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا That with these analogies and these comparisons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, misguides many and guides many. So with the same analogy, some will be misguided, some will be guided, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ and the only people that are misguided, that actually the analogy and the clarification and the guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's a cause for somebody's misguidance, it's because they are fasiqeen to begin with. Uh, and fasiq would be like somebody who's rebelled against um, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these verses and these analogies um, serve as a misguidance, a continued misguidance for this person. Okay. So we're talking about analogies. So the first point that I want to make is the importance of analogies, the importance of comparison in education in helping people to understand something. You know, let me give you this example. You know when Ramadan begins and people say Ramadan is like, um, and you're welcome to post that. I've actually said this in my other lecture, but... Um, um, I've said this in my other, what is the analogy or the metaphor of Ramadan? Some will say, and you're welcome to post um, as uh, in the comments, if you will. Um, I'll give you five seconds. So what, the analogy of Ramadan is what to you? What is the metaphor of Ramadan? I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Ramadan is like? All right. As you guys, now the comments will start popping in when I continue on. So some people will say Ramadan is like a guest. And just like a guest comes from out of town and you prepare and clean your house. Yeah, the first comment was, Rifat says, an honored guest. Yes. Um, just like a guest comes from out of, out of town, you prepare for this guest. Yeah. You've got on the other side, somebody will say Ramadan is like um, a special offer, a special limited time offer, like last two nights of Ramadan, um, worth a thousand months, get it while it's hot uh, because the, the time is going to come to an end. The, uh, and some people will say Ramadan is like a boot camp or a gyms preparing you building up taqwa for afterwards. And the, the lecture that I gave before was, I wish people would start thinking about Ramadan as... Um, as a vocational institute, a, a vocational training institute, a career college. Because if you think of the honored guest metaphor, that when the honored guest leaves, your house goes back to the kind of like the, the disorder that happened before. If you looked at the special offer type of analogy, then you might say that after Ramadan, well, there's no special offer going on, and I only worship low special offers and stuff like that and then people might fall back and that's why and boot camp the reason i don't like boot camp as well is i'm not saying these analogies are bad i just want you to understand um, um the benefits and cons and how important it is because uh, how important these metaphors or the lessons that we derive from them if you look at the um, metaphor of a gym or a boot camp a lot of times people go to the gym and then do nothing with what they've learned. So, okay, you're lifting up some weights, but it doesn't lead to something afterwards. Um, and it's just like, you're just going through the motions. It depends on what gym means to you. Now, uh, 
when you think of vocational institute or training college, you're there in the college training, just like in Ramadan, you're praying your salah and you're fasting, all that. You're training for what comes after, so that you'll have taqwa afterwards. So the point of all of this that I'm, I'm just sharing with you is the importance of analogies and comparisons and metaphors in education and in helping somebody to understand what's going on. You also see, um, and we benefit from this, that if this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's teaching us through analogies and comparisons, and Allah loves for us to understand, it's we should also learn that we want somebody to understand what we're saying. We don't just like um, information dump on somebody and just like, you know what, uh, I hope you understand, I don't care. But we actually care to come from a different angle, try to explain things in different ways. And once you start opening your mind to you know, the Quran and Sunnah being like analogies, you're actually gonna start seeing these analogies and comparisons all throughout the Quran and in the Hadith. And I'll get to it in a second. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, you will also want to learn from this uh, that criticism, that nobody is going to avoid criticism. It doesn't matter what you say or who you are. And you could be perfect. <laughs> this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're criticizing Allah azza wa jalla. You can, the Prophet وسلم, when he received revelation, they said he's crazy. They said he's a uh, uh, majnoon. They said he's a magician. They said he's a poet. Everybody will receive criticism, and, and that's Allah and his messenger. And anybody who takes this path and just being human, part of being human is, subhanAllah, that people will criticize. And it doesn't matter what you do that the criticism will come, it's just how do you respond to it? Now the um, the beautiful lesson that we learn here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah's response to it is, Allah is not ashamed or not la yastahi and yadribi mathana. Allah is not ashamed to give any analogy that he wishes, whether that's a mosquito or anything larger than that. Anything larger, anything smaller than that. Allah is not ashamed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't respond to God can make analogies and this and that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so what? <laughs> like, so they make a criticism and the response is, so what? And so if you are in this path and you're, exp uh, and you're educating and teaching people things, you'll have two groups of people. There will be the person who appreciates what you say and you have the person who doesn't appreciate what you say. And a lot of times when somebody's just hating on you, um, it's not because they're so concerned about what you said, but they're hating on you from something that's deeper than that. That as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ That it's from their fisk, from the rebellion against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they want to find a criticism. They want to find a criticism. So let's talk a little bit more about analogies, metaphors. What's the difference between an analogy and a metaphor. What's the difference between an analogy and a metaphor? And you know what? Let me also teach you something else here. Let me write it down before I forget. What's the difference between analogy and a metaphor? So um, a metaphor, an analogy is something direct and explicit. So you say something is like something else. So he said Ramadan is like um, is like an honored guest. Ramadan is like a training institute. You could say that that's an analogy. It's explicit and it's direct. This is like that, yeah? Or photography is like, um, is like uh, making an idol or photography is like looking in the mirror, right? Two analogies that will come to two different uh, conclusions. Another, what's, what a metaphor is a little bit more vague and implicit. So it's a little bit more vague and implicit. It's more open to meanings. It's more open to contemplation. You could say a metaphor is like life is like a journey, right? It's very, um, it's very general. What does journey mean? What, is, what does that mean to you? It means different things. To you. So you can say it's a metaphor. And subhanAllah for myself. As I've, you know, years after, especially these last two years, I've really tried to look at the metaphors that I use and try to change them. Because once you change your metaphor, you actually change your action. And when somebody comes to me and they have problems, um, oh, I have problem, I can't get married or I have problem in this or that. I like to ask them, what's the metaphor 
for this thing that you're having problem with. And usually when they say their metaphor, they'll give me a metaphor that's like, it's like being in a suffocating box. <laughs> like it's a very serious type of metaphor. And when you look at somebody who doesn't have a problem with that issue, their metaphor is different. The other thing that I'd like to um, advise you about this is metaphors. A lot of people, when it comes to argumentation about Islamic issues, this is kind of like as we're all here listening Muslims and stuff like that. A lot of times when it comes to argumentation and Islamic issues with people who don't know Quran and Sunnah, they don't know the Quran, they haven't you know, reviewed the Hadith, they like to fall back on analogies. So they'll say... Um, uh, wearing hijab is like, and then they throw an analogy, or um, doing this is like that, and they try to base their argument on an analogy. And I would tell you that um, the sources, as soon as I'm arguing with somebody, and they, and they, and if they say something to me like that, they throw an analogy at me. I would, this is my response. I would say the sources of Sharia, the sources of how do we know something is from Allah and His Messenger, are four things four main agreed upon things. Number one is the Quran. Number two is the authentic sunnah of the Prophet um, uh, Number three is uh, uh, ijma. Ijma is the consensus. The ummah has agreed upon this throughout centuries. Um, ijma. And the fourth thing is qiyas. And qiyas is analogy. And so I would tell this person what you just said, your argumentation, the argument that you just made, you're trying to use the fourth source, which is qiyas, which is um, analogy. And we know in Islamic law that if analogy goes against the Quran or goes against the authentic sunnah, it is rejected. It is rejected. And you didn't even know the Quran and sunnah. And this is the ayah that explicitly says the opposite of your analogy. So let's just take your analogy and throw it to the wall kind of thing. Um, it's and usually just you break it down like that. Analogy is not valid if it contradicts the Quran. Analogy is not valid if it contradicts the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Okay, so let me give you some places, um, kind of topics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses analogy for in the Quran. So uh, first thing is, when it comes to iman, when it comes to kufr, when it comes to nifaq, iman, kufr, belief, disbelief, and hypocrisy, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses analogies to explain what these things are. Another area that we see analogies is um, encouraging good. Encouraging good and pushing away um, bad. So you'll see th things like when, it, when we're talking about pushing away harm, um, bad things like backbiting. Backbiting is like... Everybody, every Muslim is like eating the flesh of your dead brother, right? It's an analogy. That's what backbiting is. You'll also see the, the analogy of um, for encouraging good is like the reward for charity. And as Ramadan has come and you've been to fundraisers and you've heard um, the analogy is like a stock in each stock has you know somebody who gives in the path of Allah, gives in the, for the sake of Allah, and it breaks into, um, it's like a stock that bears seven fruits and each of those has uh, um, seven. So then you're seeing like it goes up 700 times. The analogy, the reward of doing good. You'll see that analogies come when it's something that's halal and lawful, and analogies come when something's haram and harmful. Uh, another area that you'll see analogies in the Quran is when it distinguishes a righteous person versus um, a not righteous person. And I'll end with this last analogy. The Prophet Sallallahu said that the analogy or the example of somebody you sit with that is um, salih, is a righteous person, and somebody you sit with who is um, um, who is a bad influence and su is a, a bad person is like sitting with somebody who sells perfume and somebody who um, plays with fire. And so the person who plays, um, um, the person who has the perfume, you either are going to get perfume from this person or at the very least, being in this person's presence, you will enjoy the beautiful smell of being with that person. And the person who is playing with fire, he's either going to burn you or you will come with your clothes stinking from that fire. 
And so I hope inshallah ta'ala that these little reminders that we um, that we do together are inshallah ta'ala jaleez salih that I get to sit with you and benefit from your good perfume inshallah ta'ala. And of course I enjoy um, reviewing Quran with you guys because the Quran is barakah. And we wish for that barakah in our lives. Allah ta'ala alam. Our reminder is done. If you guys want to chat or have questions, we'll go about 10 minutes inshallah. Zakallah khairan. Thank you, Susu. Alaikum assalam, Abdul Basit. Anybody got a question? An honor guest. Al Jalisu Salih, Wal Jalisu Suh. Jamzadi says, Zakala I really appreciate your visionary emails. Jazakala Khairan. During the last days of Ramadan. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's messed up, huh? <laughs> Yesterday it worked, yes today it didn't work. So my apologize for the Instagram people. Okay, cool. MB1429. I didn't quite understand the whole criticism of Allah. Sorry, I know it's a bit of a stupid question. No, it's not stupid. No problem. <laughs> don't, don't call. Don't call the question stupid. All right. So this is the criticism. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran um, mentions like Surah Al-Ankabut. Surah Al-Ankabut is the surah of the spider. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kamathal uh, Al-Ankabut. Like the home of the spider is so flimsy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, that um, that what they built, you know, their um, their worship, the polytheist, what they is like a bait al ankabut. It's like the house of a spider, it's so flimsy. So that's an analogy. Another um, so you get it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentioned analogies using insects. Used um, mosquito, used spider, used ants. A, a lot of them about ants, but um, so the mushrikeen wanted to criticize Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and and they basically says, um, isn't Allah ashamed to um, give analogies of something so small and insignificant and petty like a mosquito? Or um, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala responded, in Allah la yastahi, ma. So that was. The criticism. Wallahu alam. Layla's question: How do we know if we are of righteous or non-righteous companionship or company? So I guess you're talking about like, how do you know if you yourself am I? Am I good influence for the person I'm sitting with or am I bad? Or are you talking about the person? The simple response to that is in your companionship with somebody else, are you um, encouraging good, forbidding evil, basically? So if there's something halal and good that is being spoken about in your companionship with somebody else, then that's a righteous um, companionship. If what's happening in this in this companionship is like backbiting and gossiping and and doing haram things or encouraging haram things then it's non-righteous companionship a lot thank you Aisha says, I took Dreamwalker last year and have to still work on my cards and I'm a little bit lost. Would you still recommend signing up? So um, just generally speaking, whenever, um, you know, Aisha, this is kind of like for Aisha and for people who take Visionaire. You know, when people take Visionaire for the first time 
And, and then the people who have taken it multiple times kind of turn back and say, you know, when I did this for my first time, I wasn't really in, like my mind wasn't there. I wasn't really present. And now that I'm, you know, I'm back again, um, I'm going to be more serious. I, uh, now that I've experienced what it's like, you know what, I'm taking the effort to make this count. And so even for me, it may be if I, if I took, you know, Visionaire 2030, I taught the class and maybe I wasn't fully present in doing my own work, I'm looking forward to teaching it again. And okay, I know what mistakes I did or, or how I didn't put my full mind and energy into my work. I know next time I do it, inshallah ta'ala, I'll get stronger and better. Now, if that's the case with you, Aisha, that you say, hey, you know what I learned from this past and I wanna get back into a group and I wanna get it done now that I have experienced what happened in the past, that I'm ready to um, um, take better action this time, then it definitely, inshallah ta'ala, will be worth it. Jazakallah khair and Tisha, thanks for tuning in. One thing about um, about the Quran, when I started Al Maghrib Institute, I did this little um, survey back in the day. I remember I was at George Mason University in Virginia and I was you know, handing out the survey and I asked people, what was the first Al Maghrib Institute class that they would like to learn? I think it was like 2002. And overwhelmingly people said that they wanted to learn about Quran. And so the first al Maghrib seminar was Tafsir Juzamma, which was touched by an angel, the first class I ever taught in, um, in um, and it launched al Maghrib Institute. And one thing that I learned from teaching that class, subhanAllah, how much love people gave me. And I realized like, you don't even know me, but your love is for the Quran. And I really experienced the barakah of, of teaching Quran. So it's not, that um, you know, I'm doing a service to the Quran. The Quran is doing a service to us. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarak. That Allah subhanahu wa taala sent this book mubarak. And as we saw in yesterday's um, live about the Quran being um, hidayah, and if we want more hidayah, we should more guidance. We should con connect ourselves more with the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Dalik al kitabu la raiba fi." It's a guide for the muttaqeen. So if we want to be more guided, we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer that dua of guide us to the straight path, we should get more in connection with the Quran, which I, which I know you do, Tisha. So alhamdulillah. Need your views. I need your views. <laughs> Jamzadi Jamzadi says, some schools of thought, scholars, don't recommend Shawal fasting, need your point of view. I've never heard that before. I, like, I've never heard somebody say that uh, fasting Shawal is not recommended. Let me just, fasting Shawal. One moment, please. Let me just see. I need to check something. Okay, so yeah, so the hadith that speaks about fasting in shawal is narrated by Musahih Muslim. Whoever fasts Ramadan and follows it with six days of shawal, it will be as if he fasted for a lifetime. So it's in um, um, Sahih Muslim, and so it's authentic. So done deal. Doesn't matter what people think, like I said before. I'm going to take like one or two last questions and then we're and then we're done. Zainab Abdi, um, Israf, we'll talk about that maybe on uh, on another topic. I guess it's kind of like I think it'll crash my brain going into a different direction right now. This is a nice comment here. I hope you had a great Eid. Alhamdulillah, it was very nice. How was your Eids, you guys? Some people are saying with Eid lockdown, they actually had a really nice time. Um, they didn't have to visit so much with immediate family and they had a great time. How was your Eid with the lockdown? 
Shukri says, through Al Maghrib Institute and Touched by an Angel, I have the CDs and listen to it in my car. Alhamdulillah. May Allah protect your CDs from melting, inshallah. All right, last question, good question here. Shay, how to distinguish between constructive versus destruct destructive um, criticism? So our last question is like Allah khairan word that um, constructive criticism. So first off, I guess there's from your side of things. Like, um, so we're talking about people sending you criticism. So you actually want to, even if, um, so here's some 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 kind of like tips. You want to look at the person who's giving the criticism, and you want to ask yourself this question: that you know, look at the results that they're getting in their life, and ask yourself, do I want these results for myself? So if they give you criticism, and like let's suppose you are a um, I don't know, just really bad analogy, but let's suppose you're an actor. A a, a theater actor and then the person who's who's criticizing you is this great theater actor and they're criticizing you and whether it's painful or whatnot you want to listen to that person because they have experience and you um you respect the results that they get so that constructive or not constructive you want to listen to that kind of person if you have somebody who you don't kind of respect the results that they've gotten which happens a lot online just kind of like nasty comments generally just a nasty comment of course you can um, pass that by but if you find that those comments are coming up repeatedly um, then you might want to pay attention to what's being said because it, even if it's saying in a destructive way uh, if it's being said repeatedly, there's probably some truth to it. So I would. So the second thing is the repetition of this um, criticism. So sometimes when there's a criticism, I would ask the question: How many people had the same criticism and independently? So not that one person went around and told everybody, but how many independent people had a criticism like this? And then you might want to address it. Um, and so on. The other thing on the on another hand is sometimes let's suppose you've got 100 people and 98 of them love what you're doing and they're actually really benefiting. And then two of them, you're a loser, you're going to hellfire, they hate your guts. There's two of them. So 98 people love what you So if you decide to just call, uh, follow everything that a critic says and just so you don't kind of like rock the boat with anybody, you may do something that is pleasing to these two people who don't care anyway, whether you listen to them or not, they just want to criticize you, but you might change something that the 98 of the 98% of the people are actually benefiting from. So I'll give you an example, let's suppose uh, oh, Muhammad al-Sharif gives jokes while he talks. And you guys like that, and I'm a really cool guy and stuff like that. <coughs> but then somebody somebody comes in the comment section and says, brother, you know what, this is haram. You should stop making jokes. You're talking about serious things. And then I start crying, and I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't make jokes. And then so the next time I come uh, and I'm giving a speech, it's just all serious and I'm all like, um, I'm not being me. And then you'd say, what happened to Muhammad? So actually it, things become worse because you listen to the critic. So those are some ways to analyze whether criticism is constructive or destructive. Jazakallah khairan everybody. Alhamdulillah, I hope you had a good time. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll be doing this daily. I don't know the exact time. I'm letting it organically happen where I find myself um, leaning towards the timing. So just keep when it says, you know, um, tell me when Muhammad Sharif goes live, just press that button inshallah ta'ala. If you're online, then that's great. All right, bye. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.